at first it was weird because I never addressed Lundy, right? It's Lachelle Mundy. Like, obviously we all know like the Bowser cringe lesbian is mm -hmm. Lundy. Lundy's followers are like coming for you in the comments. Welcome to Queer Talk, number one podcast to connect all of your favorite queer creators in a space where we share our stories on all things queer related. Hey, if you're new to listening to this, hit that subscribe button on Apple Podcasts and give us a follow on Spotify. Our guest on today is the number one Lundy impersonator. You can find her at Laura underscore Zan. Please welcome Lauren Stevens. Hey, how's it going? Thanks yeah. for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for being on. I have always, I've watched your stuff. Like I have, I've had you on my list to interview for like a hot ass second. And I started seeing all of your Lundy shit and I was like, Oh yeah. Like I have to get her on. I mean, like I said, Lachelle has taken on like a character of itself. People are like Lachelle 2020. So, I mean, I don't know how running the country would go. I think like the pledge of allegiance would be like, you hit the woe and then put your hand over your heart. So I, I don't know. She, <laughs> she's grown in size though. It's crazy. <laughs> I love that you call her Lachelle. That's like absolutely hilarious. How did you come up with that? So I was duetting this other TikToker and I looked at all the sounds and like the people duetting her and they were really, really serious. And it was really masculine lesbians just answering her questions. And they were all like, yeah, like, like, rubbing the hands like Birdman and just, you know, that facade that masculine yeah. lesbians feel like they need to take on. And yeah. um, I mean, it could be them and that's all well and good, but that's kind of how I got the idea. I do edit her and actually I wasn't even thinking of Lundy at all. And people were like, this is spot on. This is so good. Start naming her. So I was like, holy shit. And uh, it came to me in a dream to create Lachelle because you just see all these influencers online and and so i wanted to see how she influenced and it was a lot of um, mouthing rap lyrics and a lot of growling and hitting the woe so i <laughs> thought i would pull a kate mckinnon and just try to create lachelle and that's how lachelle was born <laughs> that's awesome kate mckinnon is the queen of impersonations oh like she does uh, hillary clinton so fucking well justin that's her i mean Bieber. justin b oh yeah justin, justin Bieber. Bieber. I channeled that too, so God. she's amazing. So you must be like a big SNL fan then, because I am I'm a big SNL fan too. Huge SNL. 90s SNL over any SNL, but I mean, they've always got really, really good comedians on there. They do. I mean, it's fallen off, just be, I think, just because of um, streaming and different ways to, to get stand-up, where before yeah. SNL stand-up was kind of the main way, unless you like physically went and saw someone doing stand-up comedy or like you got tapes, you know, it was like the easiest streamlined way to do it was to watch every night on Saturday, you know, Saturday night yeah. or like tape it, record it, whatever. And now you have, you know, Netflix specials and you have, you know, YouTube, all of these different mediums, TikTok, all of these different mediums for comedy. Yeah. And it kind of is, I feel like putting SNL to the wayside when it used to be the huge popular thing in 70s, 80s, 90s. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that every, I feel like, comedian wanted to be a part of. I remember when I was eight years old, I told my mom my dream was to move to Brooklyn, get an apartment, and I don't even know if it's filmed in Brooklyn, but be on SNL. And she was like, you know, uh, sorry, mom, but she was like, you know, there's tons of people out there funnier than you. And so I was like, oh, oh my gosh. So here I am making TikToks, but yeah, SNL, I, I feel like it was the dream, but like you said, with all these other platforms and social media, it's, it's kind of gone to the back burner. Yeah. I think that sucks though, because I feel like it really was its prime, like you said, like in the 90s and even the early 2000s, you know, oh, you yeah. had Will Ferrell and then you had Kristen Wiig. Kate McKinnon's still good. And, you know, she's like, she, I think she's still on it. Um, at least she was last season. Yeah, um, she's, she's one of us. I think it makes it special because <laughs> she's part of our community, you know. Oh, yeah. And she does you gotta a lot cheer of queer for your skits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's, I, I've seen, I think I've probably seen all of the skits that she's ever done. Yeah. Not just not, not just like the gay ones, but also the not gay ones. Oh yeah. Um, like you said, Hillary Clinton. Oh my God. It's, it's so oh, on best. point. And I think it's funny cause she's, she loves her so much. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you're fangirl and you get to be the person that like 
does that. So it's not even like right. she's making fun of, like, you know, when Alf Baldwin does Trump, obviously. Oh, my gosh. Obviously, he doesn't like him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but he still does it absolutely amazing. I mean, it was so good that when, when that video went viral, I thought that was Trump. I was showing people in the office at work. I was like, look at this little girl roasting Trump. And they're like, dude, that's Alec Baldwin. And I was like, <laughs> I am a spreader of fake news and it is what it is. But I mean, it is hilarious. Yeah. I used to watch, there was a special that used to play. I don't know if it was like, uh, I don't have cable anymore, but it was called the women of SNL. And it was like the best skits of the women of SNL. And it had like Molly Shannon oh and Kristen gosh. Wiig and Tina. Tina Fey was maybe more a writer, but Amy Poehler, Amy Poehler. like, oh, holy so shit. Good. Leslie yeah. Nope, she has my heart. Leslie Nope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but man, that's cool. Um, you've also been getting a lot of hate with those two. Like you have a lot of like the Lundy's followers who are like coming for you in the comments. I, I don't know. normally check the comments, but you had so many on your videos. I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. Yeah. I mean, at first it was weird because I never addressed Lundy, right? It's Lachelle Mundy. Like, <laughs> but people, obviously we all know like the Bowser cringe lesbian is mm -hmm. Lundy, but you can channel all of them and just, I named it, but then I mean, it is, it is about her, but they did start coming for me. They were like, oh, you're bullying, you're bullying. And I, I try to like not cross that line of that personal because I know people can grow. And I know yeah. I had that toxicity, that douchebagism. Like mm -hmm. I thought it was cool to treat women a type of way because I had been hurt, right? Yeah. And until you kind of find yourself, you know, it is what it is, but uh, I hope she grows. But yeah, her followers, I mean, they need to get off her strap, man, because they're like, you're bullying. And I'm like, dude, like I said, I, I never claim to be a good person. Like, I say I'm a good person. So maybe like, I don't know, maybe I can get some beneficial stuff out of it. But to be honest, I, I, I think there's a fine line between if you're going to be a comedian, nothing can be really off limits. Yeah you know and i'm really sorry she gives me really good shit and i'm really good at it so i'm i'm really sorry i'm trying to like kind of veer away and maybe do like not every video being that because i i don't know i don't know if you've seen like chelsea lynn doing like trailer trash tammy but like it's just these people and they create these characters and they just are so big that that's kind of how they gain that momentum and You're right next, next thing you know it could go somewhere, you know? And um, I, I mean, I just do it for fun and likes, but uh, like I said, I never claim to be like a good person, but, <laughs> but, it, but it is annoying. Like they're like, you're bullying her. And I'm like, my human side's like, am I bullying her? Oh my God. But then I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, but I hope she grows. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the Whatever thing, like, she has, but she, like, hasn't yet. So it's, like, it's not like she has completely turned a new leaf and you're, like, shitting on her past former right. self. And people are like, come on, man, like, she's different and, and stuff like that. Like, yeah, would be a little different. And then maybe your comedy would change with that, too. Like, maybe you could still do it, but, like, do it in a different way. Right. It'll work. And, like, I had... Ashley Gavin on a former episode and she's a comedian. You've probably seen her stuff because she has right. big on TikTok, has a huge podcast and we got her on and we talked about comedy for a while because of that boundary of like, what's just offensive enough that it's funny, but not offensive enough to like get canceled and like you're a piece of shit. Right. It's really tough to, to walk a line of that. And it's something like I've never toyed with myself because I've I've gotten so much shit from things that aren't even telling the line. So I'm just like, Jesus fucking Christ. TikTok is just crazy. Like you'll have people saying the most off the wall stuff. Like I remember when I was new to it and I didn't, I didn't have a lot of followers, but somebody came on there, like obviously no profile picture, no content. They're literally there to just like troll. Yeah. And it was the craziest thing that they typed. They, they said somehow my video was transphobic, which was like way off. And I was like, wow, these people on here are really ruthless. Like yeah. they, they really pick and choose what they want to go for. And like, especially it's weird, this cancel culture and like these people online just waiting for you to say the wrong thing. It's like, dude, just yeah. enjoy the videos. If you don't enjoy it, there's a button, not interested, bam, you're gone. Yeah. 
You're the gone. People, you can say not interested. You can right. follow people. You can get the fuck off social media. Like, Thank you. You have right. so many. You you're in control of everything right. you see. Literally, the algorithm is in your control. It is you. <laughs> like so, it, it it knows you better than you know yourself. You know. Yeah. And so, why are you on my page if you haven't? liked something that veers towards it. Maybe the algorithm thinks I'm Lundy now. I don't fucking know, you know? <laughs> yeah. The masculine thing, that's something that I wanted to talk about too, just with, you know, having that, and, and I feel like you had kind of touched on that in some of your videos, just about that hyper-masculinization and all the toxic masculinity that comes with those type of, you know, queer stereotypes of being like a hey mama's lesbian and stud lesbians and butch lesbians and and having to feel like as, and I don't know if you identify yourself as a butch or, or anything like that, but you know, like what are your kind of thoughts on, on that type of, uh, the stuff that's being brought on to women who are presenting more masculine? I'm going to speak for myself. So I came out really late in the game. And so when I came out, I was like 22 years old, right? So I live in the South. My parents I was terrified so I come out and to be honest like I never had that dating life I never had those teen years to get out all my my douchiness and so that kind of just picked up there and um I kind of made my personality off of what I would see like television or like like my guy cousins or you know just yeah. the more masculine spitting game at the bar taking someone home yeah uh, just bullshit but also I was really hurt in my first relationship obviously we all have that one girl that yeah. first one that you're like we're gonna be together forever and it yep. just blows up so I feel like that facade comes from also being hurt by somebody and so you have this wall of toxic masculinity so mm -hmm. a you can leave before you're left b you can't get hurt even though masculine lesbians we hurt the most we are so sensitive i yeah. mean my girlfriend is a hard 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 femme i mean she's yeah. a freaking rock star but sometimes we'll be watching a movie and like i'm the one blubbering yeah over there in my like tj maxx button downs and my vans <laughs> and my skinnies and she's over here in a sundress sundress and heels just like why are you crying you know yeah. which yeah. which it's fine it's fine if you cry but that that whole like i said facade is just it's not really who we are on the inside and yeah. it took me a long time to find out who i was and be okay that i'm not smooth i am not this hard 10 that can just rubber chin and the, the camera and get a hundred thousand yeah. likes i'm yeah. a hard seven with a great personality and um i'm just gonna rock that but uh yeah, TikTok's full of that. TikTok is mm -hmm. full of that. And I think it's crazy too. You see this Gen Z taking that on as well. Uh -huh. And they have no idea it's okay to be yourself, whatever that yeah. looks like. Whatever, you know, I'm like a hard butch, soft femme, chapstick, lesbian. Yeah. yeah. And I will say sometimes my voice does change around whoever I'm with. Mm -hmm. Like I have higher octaves around my girlfriend and, yeah. you know, my inner like, like diva can come out, but yeah. if I'm at the bar or something, I might yep. not be so outgoing. I might lean and, <laughs> you know, I don't really have huge lips to bite, but like, you know, I can yeah. still be that person. So I get, yeah. I think it's just conditioning of what we think looks cool. And I yeah. just, I mean, it's spread. That's nationwide in our community of yeah. masculine women acting like that. I think it is super interesting. Like, when you were talking about acting like the the men in your family and things like that. And I find it so interesting because it's like, even though they're men and they might have more masculine traits, like masculinity and femininity is it's, it's appears in everyone. Like mm -hmm. if you're, you know, one gender, if you're genderless, like it doesn't matter. And so like, fluid. it is, it's super fluid. And the fact that, you know, because I feel like I had done that too, and more so with, I, I wouldn't say my family, but like 
guys that I had dated in the past that I like pretty much wanted to be and like didn't actually want to be with them and like that kind of thing like girls that I had crushes on I like wanted to be kind of like their boyfriends you know what I mean like I never was like jealous Mm. but I was always like ooh, like I really like that girl and like ooh, like I really like his style you know what I mean oh I still do that I'm like I told my girlfriend I'm like I want to be him yeah like tatted snapback like big burly yeah you know whatever all black johnny cash just looking so cool Uh and uh, i think we you know that's crazy we can try to we can try to take that on and i do think it it is kind of hard because we're not men like we're Mm -hmm. not wired like men you know and and to try and yeah yeah, seriously (laughs) jesus christ um (laughs) but we try to embody something that we just aren't like, we aren't wired like men, you know, men and women have slightly different brains. Like there's just like different, some differences. And so to compare ourselves to a gender that we just like, we aren't, like we don't feel like we are. And I I mean, I'm saying this, if like, you're not someone who is trans and and, and things like that, like if you're, you know, you're a woman and you, and you're trying to be something that you're not is is what I'm kind of getting at here. Um, and embodying someone who in society has, has, has oppressed women. And now we want to take those type of oppressive techniques and bring them into our culture. Right. Um, women and queer folks who like and, other And women. hurt more women, like, with yeah. that oppression when we should be a community. And I don't think it just is with, you know, with masculine presenting women that are doing it to feminine women. It can be the other way around as well. Like those kind of toxic masculinity can be with the hard femmes, the, you know, like the stems, the tomboys, that kind of thing. Like those things can be very ever present, you know, the toxicity and having people on the bench and having people, oh, this person's a priority. Ah, no, I'm bored of her. We're going to bring the other person up to play. Absolutely. And making people feel special when you really didn't give a shit about them. And, you know, like, it just all the uh, being emotionally unavailable. There's just so many different things. Yeah. You can, maybe, you can align with it, but yeah. And I think it's crazy that maybe not all of us, but we all have a period where we go for that. Like, Mm, oh, this person is, they look like they could ruin my life. I am down. Please like me. And I don't know what that's all about. Like, kind of like a masochist, like hurt me, but emotionally, uh, maybe physically, but emotionally for sure. Uh, There's something just alluring sometimes about that. And I think that's also where that comes from. I think you have that one person in your life that you know that it's bad for you, but for some reason, like, you're addicted to it, like the yes. highs and the lows. And that's why it's toxic because like the highs are great and the lows are horrible. Yes. But you're waiting around to get that high. And you Wait. only remember the good, which is crazy. You never, you always shut out the bad Yeah. when it comes around. But yeah, fire and gasoline, man. We, we got to mm-hmm. stay away from it. We're only hurting ourselves. Yep. And I was talking this on my last podcast episode just about like, I got into like attachment theories and like people who are like kind of more the anxious attachment usually go for people who are the more like avoidant, emotionally available. And like we can switch amongst them. We're not just like one our whole life, you know, but like those dynamics go hand in hand with someone who's constantly getting layers lack, right? They're needing more, regardless if what they're getting is true or if they're really being starved in the relationship, their needs aren't being met, but they keep thinking that they're going to be. And it's Mm -hmm. just like this, push and pull and it's fucking toxic yeah and I think we also mirror what we are inside as well like if we go for something like that we don't think we deserve someone who will meet us in the middle you know so like like you said if you're not emotionally available don't make yourself available yeah work work on you and then they'll (laughs) just fall from the sky like an angel in your lap and you don't have to just like someone just because they like you and make a game out of it. That got heavy. <laughs> we don't need no attention seekers in here. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> oh, man. But, like, speaking of that kind of those those highs and lows and stuff like that, I mean, it, it really is like like love is a drug. It is a, an absolute drug. It does not, it's not in the category in the DSM for substance abuse. But I think people... 
are addicted to love and falling in love because of the chemicals and shit like that. It's just like, yes. you know, people who drink excessively, shop excessively, you know, all of that shit. Like it really is. And you have those people that are in those constant patterns. If they're always in relationships, they're always talking to people. They're never truly alone. Ever alone. And you always see too, like it's like monkey on a branches, man. You don't let go of one branch until you have your hand on another branch. Yeah. And it's so common, especially with lesbians, like, you know, break up. For me, I'm a wreck, right? For months, I'm like, I'm done. And I'll go four months literally without getting some. And then I'm like, I'm done with it. I'm done. But like all my ex-girlfriends, I'm like, good luck, Chuck. They were all in something like a week or two later. And I'm like, that's fishy. Yeah. Like, you know, now they're all married to that person. So I think oh, I am God. Good, I am good luck, Chuck. They were straight though. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it wouldn't have ended well anyway. So it oh, led me wow. right where I need to be with a real lesbian who is like yeah. great. That's awesome. Well, yeah. good for you. I'm glad you had to, you know, be with a couple of straight girls and uh, to cool. realize to get to the person that you like. Yeah. I, I was the one who liked getting really hurt, apparently. Like, Duh, they were going to leave Lauren. Duh. They, yeah. you know, the infatuation is wonderful, but it was my fault. I was a hey mamas to get them. So, yeah, well, yeah. I think that is inter something that's interesting too is like when you're not yourself, you become engulfed with someone else who sees a certain version of you. And if it's not your true version, then like you're probably not compatible, but you don't realize that until later. Mm -hmm. So if you're projecting something that's not authentic and you're getting something back and you think that it's this great, amazing thing, but you weren't being yourself, then like how could it be this great, amazing thing? Yeah. Because yeah. you're going to crack, they're going to see you one day. Yeah. They're going to see the real you one day. Yeah. For lesbians two weeks later when we move in, you know, <laughs> you just, you just plant that toothbrush or that earring and it's over. Yep. No. <laughs> and I think too, with like what you're saying on TikTok about, you know, people who are gaining all of these followings for just being hot and being, you know, sex symbols and, and doing thirst traps, which everyone loves a nice thirst trap. Absolutely. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shit on them too much, but like if you're cultivating this certain person, that's just one side of you, right? Like, and just on social media in general, if you're only showing one side of you, and, and you, you know, with, with lesbians, there's a lot of long distance stuff. So if you're like constantly seeing an Instagram or a Snapchat or whatever platform you're on, or, you know, any of the dating apps and stuff like that, like it, it can be deceiving. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially with long distance as well. Like that one, I tried that out with someone I met actually through a dating app and, uh, it was fun. Every time your phone chimes, like you're on there, but you can be anybody you want to be behind a screen. And yeah. then you spend money on a plane ticket. Yeah. You can be anybody you want to be for the weekend, but you move in yeah. together and you usually see that at least six months later, it's like burned yeah. to the ground. Exactly. You know, because of, like you said, this front we put on, like on our social media of what's hot now in society. Exactly. Just to exactly. be hot this hollow shell of hot. Yeah. But yeah, on that thread of, of the love is a drug thing, you did some videos, which I really, really liked. I love when people do vulnerable videos that, that talk about things that are not the nice Instagram worthy. My life is so perfect shit because everyone's life is a little unsatisfying regardless of where you're at in your life. It just is. It, Absolutely. It's a little unsatisfying. And you talked about your um, previous history with like alcohol abuse and, and stuff like that. Um, tell me a little bit about what made you kind of make those videos and, and kind of talk to the world about that stuff. Well, it's something I'm real passionate about. I'm actually in a 12 step fellowship. I'm in AA, which isn't so anonymous anymore, which is fine. I'm just going to put myself out there. But I see a lot of gay people and lesbian people and trans people, all these, all of our community, I see a lot of addiction and struggle because I feel like, especially for millennials, like I know for me, I hated being gay growing up. I did not want to be gay. And I mean, that was part of my, my drinking problem was like, make this go away. Like, Mm -hmm. My mom's going to hate me. I'm not going to have any friends, yada, yada, yada. Right. And it turned yeah. out to be this huge blessing, but I just wanted to put it out there. 
uh, as I started getting more like, especially like a lesbian following, like if you need help, reach out, you know, mm -hmm. because I know it's huge in our community and to get serious, it's killing people and it's yeah. isolating us, especially in Corona. Um, it's so hard to have that connection and to try your best not to isolate or just, you know, when this first started, everyone's like day drinking, woo, like yeah. we're not essential. And, you know, for people like us who are in recovery or like trying to get sober, that shit's really, it's really hard. Cause I mean, once, once you get started, you can't stop. You know, I got started at 18 and it was t 10 year everyday thing because I was, I was just struggling with who I was and other things. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine like what it's like to go through and, and have that kind of substance abuse, but I do have a story that I feel like is kind of interesting because I don't consider myself to have like an addictive personality. Like I don't even like really drink caffeine. Like I just, I don't know. Like I don't really have those kind of struggles. I have others, but right. others, but not this one. Um, but I had a, an instance and I, when I was in college and it really made me realize just how much of an issue it is. And I had ACL surgery. I was a college athlete. I nice. was starting my freshman year. It was halfway through the season and blew my knee out completely. Wow. Uh, ACL. Yep. Whole reconstructive surgery. Mm -hmm. Couldn't walk for a month. Had to relearn how to walk. I mean, it, it's a big surgery. It's a common one. But it, it was a big one. It was the second knee surgery I had had. And it really like rocked my world because it's your freshman year. So you don't know, you don't have those, you know, solid relationships with people yet. I had, you know, a few friends, but when you're new, you know, I couldn't go out to parties. I couldn't go anywhere. I had a, my, you know, my leg was wrapped up like a fucking gordita and I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> the only thing that I had was I had, I had to crutch to school. I couldn't even like get lifts or anything like that. Like they, I don't know. They wouldn't get like, come get me on the golf cart, but I literally was like on campus. Anyways, I, I guess I'm salty about that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I digress. But my whole thing was that I couldn't go to practice. Like I couldn't do anything. Like I wasn't around everyone. I was completely isolated. The only thing that I had were, was the meds that I was given, you know, like I had, I had Oxy or no, I had Percocet. And yeah. that shit was amazing. I took Absolutely. it. My third class. I remember it because it was just very routine. I would eat my lunch. Uh, it was jazz. I would pop one. And I was fucking rolling by the time I was crutching out of there. You were perky. I was perky. It was awesome. And I would go to rehab because I had to take it and it had to settle in before I'd go to rehab. So that's why I took it. I wasn't supposed to drive, but no one was fucking picking me up. So I had to drive. Yeah. Like, who else was going to do it for me? Um, with your gordita so, leg. Aww. Yeah. So, you know, I literally drove on Percocet for 30 days. Um, not that I drove very far, but it probably wasn't the best idea, but you know, it is what it is. It, it really is. Though. It's all, it's all you can do, especially you can't waste it. You know? No, and, and, and you're in pain. And that shit is so nice. It is, the, and that's the thing that got me too, because I would take it during my most social time when I, the only time I saw people was in the rehab facility. And so I, I took it, it felt amazing, but every time else, like I was so isolated and, you know, I started thinking, cause I had extra obviously when I was done with needing to take it, but I took it every single day. I took two every single day, like I got used to it. And, and I started taking it when I didn't have rehab because I didn't want to deal and I didn't have anything else to do and, and shit like that. And I didn't go to class. Not that my academics suffered or anything, but like, I was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm not going to go to class. Like, what the fuck am I going to do? Like, I'm crippled. Like I'll, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I'll figure it out. And like, it, it was so interesting, the fact that because I didn't have any other competing pleasures of, like, being able to go out and, and make that time and that isolation easily could have turned into something that could have been an, an addiction. Absolutely. Um, for someone, I feel like, who's pretty, like, doesn't have an addictive personality, for that to come out of completely nowhere and I could have been a victim to that was a huge light in my brain of, like, oh, my God. Like, I can't imagine someone who has more trauma than me, who has an addictive personality, who doesn't have the support that I had, what would ha happen to them? 
Right. Um, in that same situation or in a, in a more intense situation. And it made me realize, I feel like alcoholism and binge eating and, and all of those different things, they get such a bad rap um, comparatively to other mental health disorders because it's like, oh, you can control it. It's not this, it's this, it's this. And I'm like sitting here like I was a, a pretty model person and I almost was addicted to Percocet. Right. So like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? That's, that's big pharma for you. You know, I mean, oh, wow. thank, thank God I never got sprung on Xanax, but I, I know why the Stepford wives take that shit. Like yeah. just sit in your pretty house. And I mean, just chill. And, and you see a lot, like, what did you play soccer? Yeah. Yeah, me too. There hey. you go. Nice. Yeah. So you see a lot of athletes and all these injuries and that's the first thing they give you. Like, is oxys or perks or you know mm-hmm. something and you see all these athletes just it just feels nice and it takes away the pain and next thing you know your tolerance is building and next thing you know they won't prescribe it to you anymore so yeah. where else are you going to go your homies when your homies yeah. don't have it where else are you going to go so mm-hmm. it's just this big revolving door that really starts with big pharma that's my that's my one story on it and it it completely mm-hmm. changed my life on how I viewed things because That's I, good though. I mean, I could have, like, I could have asked for a second thing and I could have, you know, and they probably would have given it to me and mm-hmm. I could, have, you know, I could have gotten it so addicted that I was, you know, buying it off the fucking street and right. shit like that. And yeah, it, it would have been bad, but that's so how, why it's so easy. That's why people in the Vietnam war, like soldiers in the Vietnam war were addicted to heroin and the ones that came home and had other competing pleasures they stopped taking it. But the ones that didn't came home and were addicted, you know, until they died or had, you know, long term effects from it and stuff like that. So like, it's nuts. The fact that if you are isolated and and that's how like a lot of queer people are, they're isolated. They they don't know any other queer people. They're have, they have a lot of internalized issues with it and they don't have outlets for it. So that shit happens, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've talked to a few people after those videos and they would message me and it was either like people that weren't out that were struggling or people in small towns that are struggling. I mean, I live in Memphis, so my community is, it's not huge, but it's okay being gay here. But like for these people that were messaging me and they didn't have a community and their parents didn't approve of what they were doing. And on top of the Corona stuff, like you can easily just fall into that depression, isolation. Mm -hmm. And you know, like for an alcoholic, it's like, it doesn't matter if I'm celebrating or I'm mourning, like I'm drinking, you know, I'm drinking. And once I start, I can't stop until gravity itself stops me. Usually I'm so horrified about what I did. I I just start drinking again. Yeah. So just this endless cycle. It is. It really is until the pain gets great enough, you know, and society promotes that, right? Like you're sad, drink, you're anxious, drink. You've had a long day at work drink like it you know you're happy something you got a promotion like let's go out like right and the the commercials the way they make the beers sweat I'm like I don't even I don't even drink that but that looks fucking amazing you know and and it's just such a social thing until if you know if you got alcoholism or addiction issues like until it's not until you're alone Mm -hmm. in your room with a wine stained t-shirt like puking your guts up and watching a movie you're not going to remember not yeah. talking about myself or anything, but like, <laughs> yeah. it just, you know, you can't leave your house after it goes so far. It's just you and the bottle because mm-hmm. you've romanticized it and everything else just kind of goes away, yep. you know, but Ever- help is always so close. Like yeah. it's closer than anybody could ever imagine. What would you say would be the number one thing if someone's listening to this and they are going through substance abuse? really just just reach out just talk about it like I don't know why we are in 2020 and mental health is still a, a, a taboo thing like what do you do if you have strep you go to the doctor what do you do if you have the flu you go to the doctor well what do you, what do you do when you're sprung on something or you're having suicidal thoughts or like mm-hmm. all these big issues we internalize so much stuff and like I said I thought I was alone I was like, man, I'm just going to be miserable the rest of my life. And I was like, I wasn't just this bright, funny, funny. I was mean, funny. And I always say, if you got to be mean to be funny, you're not funny. And it was because like, I hated myself so much, but like, I saw my cousin 
she'd been sober quite a while. I was like, that's so fake. But finally I called her and I was like, yo, I don't care what I have to do. I do not care. Help me out. And so yeah. she, she got me into a program. She got me into a, you know, I could have gone to rehab. I did not go to rehab. I detoxed myself. I don't suggest that at all. But like there's treatment facilities. There's there's so much stuff out there if you just Google it and just talk about it. Yeah, that's my advice. Just tell somebody you're struggling. And mm-hmm. hopefully that'll be if they don't know, they'll tell somebody else who might know who, you know, you'll find it. If you like I said, if the pain gets great enough, you will find it and you'll change something and you might fall down a few times, but you can always get back up. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I I relapsed over Corona and it took a week for me to almost lose everything I had, like my house, my girlfriend, I was driving drunk. And and it's things like, I thought I had worked on myself so much and I was like, I'm ready. I'm ready to to do this again. But the work wasn't done Mm -hmm. and I knew where help was. You know, and that's why I tell people you can't beat yourself up if you can't stop drinking and like you go a period of time sober and then you drink again. You can't be you can't beat yourself up because you needed that as a part of your journey. Now, you know, now, you know, and nobody can take away that experience from you. And it's what you do with it, you know, turn it into funny content, turn it. Yeah. Makes you funny as shit. So it makes people relatable when you're talking about vulnerable things like and you're okay to like put it out there like it's well received like creators and influencers that i love the most are the ones that show the different sides of themselves they they show the different sides of themselves as a full human being who has happy days and bad days and struggles and things like that like no one can connect to someone who looks like they're having a fucking great time every day that just right. does, like nobody like does that nobody fucking does that But if you can show that you're a human being, you know what I mean? You can post sad shit. It doesn't mean that, you know, people are going to be like, oh, she's sad. I want to watch sad stuff. Like, I'm sad. I like seeing sad shit. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I want to cry with you. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to go through it with you, whatever it is. And, like, there's a few TikToks. If if you're feeling yourself, you can get dressed and do your thing, you know. Yeah. But, But usually, like, the most relatable stuff is just turning that thing on and just that one time, you know, or having this idea and just doing it. Just, doing it. Yep. You know, I'll be at work. I hope my bosses aren't listening. Probably not because they're not like queer, but <laughs> like I'll be in my work clothes. I'll go to the bathroom. I look like an absolute idiot to anyone who walks in. God forbid if that ever happened. But like you just put a green screen and I get an idea and I just go with it. Just do it. Just show yourself. Yep. Show your authentic self. People Show will it. fucking dig it. Absolutely. Uh, that's the funniest shit when I think about when I do content. Like the best stuff I have is things that like go are off the cuff. Like the ones where people really connect to it. They might not get all of the views. Like I have videos that have like, you know, millions of views. But the ones that I feel like connect are the ones that are really off the cuff. Are the ones that have the most comments always too. Yes. You know, because it, it, it talks, there's a discussion and there's something that's ultra relatable. Like there's plenty of relatable content on TikTok, but those videos that make you just belly laugh or make you watch it a million times because it speaks to your soul in some way, shape, or friends. Right. Well, that shit matters. And the algorithm doesn't recognize that, but that's okay. Like you said, it's usually like almost like the ones with no thought to it that get that 1.1 million view. And -hmm. like you think of this amazing authentic thing and you record it And like, it doesn't get a lot of views, but still like the likes and the comments, if it's relatable, then that's, that's all well and good. That's all, you know, you just got to speak to the people. Doesn't matter how many people it reaches, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. Well, cool. We'll start with question with the queers. We answer your listener submitted questions on this podcast. If you would like to submit a question, you can submit it and send me a DM on Instagram or send it to questions at queertalkpodcast.com. So Andy is 26. They're from Boston and they write, hi, Queer Talk. Love the podcast. Here's my question for you guys. I've been out for a few years, not a baby gay anymore, but I am still struggling with how I want to present. There are so many things that I want to wear. And when I see people on social media or in movies and things like that, I always think, oh, that's something that I want to wear, but I can never seem to let myself 
wear the things that I want to wear and express how I want people to see me in the real world. I grew up pretty conservative and I feel like I still probably have some of that internalized homophobia and I don't like dressing feminine. I don't feel good about myself in it, but I feel like if I dress more masculine, I am going to get unwanted attention. And since I have social anxiety, I would rather not do that and be uncomfortable than to be uber uncomfortable wearing something that I actually like. Any tips on getting over this? All right. Well, that's, that's really good because I actually went through that myself. Like I said, I had that internal, internalized homophobia. And it's funny to see pictures of the evolution of my lesbianism, right? And so it starts off with like, the plaid skirt and the old navy rugby shirt with the puka shell necklace, you know, <laughs> with, with the rope sandals, you know, straightened hair. And then that goes to like still in the women's section, maybe like a fitted flannel and skinny jeans and sandals of some sort, never a heel. Then gradually I got out of bikinis and I started buying like girls board shorts, like still girls section, but like that evolution, as, as goofy as I looked, I, I wanted to live my truth, no matter what that looked like. And especially like being in the South, like you get a lot of looks depending on where you're at. And it's still really, really hard for me to get a look still. It makes me feel really, really bad, but you have to keep living your truth. And actually, like you were saying earlier, the fluidity of it, if you want to wear some boyfriend jeans and a crop top one day, like, hell yeah. If you want to wear a snapback and like some big Ramon shirt and like black skinnies and black bands, hell yeah. Like, but just live your truth. And if it takes you a minute to get there, then that's what it takes. But like, when you get there, you'll know. Like now I have all my boy stuff and that's who I am. No matter where I go, I could be in the middle of podunk, God knows where, some old man with a Trump hat staring at me and it might infuriate me, but at least, you know, A, I'm educating these people that yes, we do exist and I'm being true to myself. Mm -hmm. You know, and thank God I have a really badass woman beside me that'll snap off on anybody. She's yeah. like, what are, you, what are you looking at? You know, like <laughs> make out with me in front of some old Trump supporter. And I'm like, oh, we're going to die. I'm going to get tarred and feathered. But, uh, at the end of the day, I'm still alive and I'm really, really happy about living my truth. And uh, I will say though this, when I started buying men's clothing, I still lived at my parents' house and my men's clothing would like come up missing, right? And so I would only wear it, like if my mom went to bed, I would wear it and I would go to the gay club by myself because I was, I knew what I was, but I, I wasn't out yet. And my men's clothes started disappearing and she was throwing them away and I didn't know she was throwing them away. Wow. I was like, where are they going? I'm so drunk. Where did I leave those neon board shorts that are so ugly, but like, I liked them. You know what I mean? And yeah. she, she finally came out and said like she was throwing them away. And even through that, like now I can wear a hat at my parents' house. You know, you can't, mm -hmm. you don't have to force that acceptance on them. They can move at their own pace, but like, if you stay true to yourself and live your truth, they'll, they'll fall in line. Yeah. You know, it might, it might hurt them, but that's not your problem. That's not your shit. Yep. You know, if the world's not ready for you, that's too damn bad. I don't know. That's my, that's my tip. Just be true to yourself, no matter how long that takes, you know, at least that seed is planted with Andy. She'll get there. Yeah. You got this. You got this, baby girl. You got this, Andy. You got this, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, Lachelle Mundy. You're the best. <laughs> you got it. I definitely agree with what, uh, with what Lauren said. You know, I remember feeling like that in like college. I like wanted to wear something that was a little more masculine and, and more tomboy. And I wouldn't let myself because I didn't want people to say certain things. And I just would rather fit in and wear the feminine clothes. It's not that I hated wearing them. I felt good on them. They looked good, you know, but I, it wasn't like my truth. And it took a while. I think just be patient with yourself. Like, you'll get there. Coming down to that decision of, you know, do I feel uncomfortable or do I potentially make other people uncomfortable? But like, making other people uncomfortable isn't your 
you're not in control of that. And that's not specifically you. It's their own views that they're projecting onto you. And it, and it comes with having confidence and not slowly not giving a shit. I mean, I gave so many shits, too many shits and wasted so much time. Uh, let me take that back. I don't feel like it was a waste of time because it was the journey that I had to go through. I had to go through giving a shit about things that I shouldn't have given a shit about. You know, you get to a point where you get older and you give less and less shits about things and you give more shits about the things that actually matter. And it, it takes a while. I'm sure I still, I give shits about stuff that I won't in 10, 20 years that I care about now. I'd be a little nicer to yourself you know, sometimes I try and think like, what would my best friend say? Or what would my mom say? Or like, if you were to give yourself advice, like you were giving it to a friend, what would you say? And you're nine times out of 10 going to be kinder to yourself because you're kinder to your friends. I'm always kinder to my friends than I am to myself. So I try and try and take that information and be nicer, be nicer to myself. That's good stuff. It's so cute. All right. Well, this is our lightning round, Lauren. It's where we answer questions really, really fast. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. All right. Snow White or Cinderella? Mm, Cinderella. Ah, cool. Ever worn socks with sandals? Yes. <laughs> Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock? Dave Chappelle. Hey, nice. I'd say the same thing. Giving presents or getting presents? Giving presents. Okay. A big spoon or little spoon? I'm a little spoon, man. <laughs> I fucking knew it. <laughs> That's Look, I find joy in being the little spoon, okay? Uh, I get it. I do too. If the toilet paper is out, do you replace it or do you set a new roll on the top of the empty roll? It depends the type of day I'm having. <laughs> okay. Always waterfall, though. Always over, never under. Okay, okay. I get it. Last question. Favorite queer movie? Oh, my gosh. I just watched A Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Yeah. My God, so good. Elise makes fun of me because most people say portrait and I love portrait and I talk to, about portrait every single time I do this. And she goes, can you just like, you always drone on about portrait of a lady. And I'm like, I've talked to a new person every week about so portrait of a lady. Good. I need to tell them my thoughts on it. It's a whole new conversation. You're just hearing it every single week. Like, my mind was blown. Like, of course I'm going to watch, like, the Netflix movies that are, like, really subpar just because there's a lesbian cast. I'm like, this is shitty, but, like, yeah. go lesbians. But, oh, my God, yep. like, I'm down for subtitles, like, French movies, whatever. But they were amazing. That was amazing. Oh, oh I became obsessed with Adele Hanel Adele? for a good month. Dude. Um, I watched all the TikToks on her. There's this one girl that's obsessed with her and she like posts TikToks and I follow her. I might have her on the podcast since I love Portrait of a Lady so much, but she's like a little, like she's like 18. She's like super cute. And I was like, oh, this is adorable. Like she has an entire fan account for it and I'm watching all the videos and I'm saving them, like saving them to like my camera roll. She has um, good taste. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of my favorite movies. Like, I watched it, like, three times in a row. I mean, it's a two-hour movie with so, subtitles. Yeah. you got to watch it. Sorry, Elise, but I'm going to say it again. you got to watch it once, and then you got to watch just the subtitles, and then you got to watch it a third time after you watch the interviews and you get the plot summary because you just miss certain things, you know? And I mean, yeah. Like, the TikToks, I was like, who is this Adele person? What is going on? Like... They're touching in the interviews. And then I, I mean, I didn't yeah. do any research. And then I go on Apple TV and it's suggested, obviously. And um, I watched it and I was like, holy shit. And so I'm going to have to do that because I, I think I did a little bit of both, but I'm going to have to watch it, then subtitle it, then put yep. it all together. Because yep. I'm so down to watch it like 10 more times. I know. I think I'm going to watch it again. I have to be in like the mood where I need to... I need to be in the mood to cry. I cried. <laughs> my butch ass was like, I'm so glad my girlfriend was already in bed because I was like, say hi from across the like the theater to just do it. But, but she didn't do it. Aww. And but that goes back to whatever they were talking about. You remember? I, I'm mad that like, bitch, you couldn't have waited until after. You couldn't wait until after and been like, hey. Like, considering the time period, when are you going to fucking see her again? Like, and you see just, her and you can't say hi after the show? Like, the intermission or the bathroom or, like, the concession stand. Like, 
We need a part two. We need we, we need to know what happens after. Absolutely. And I need I think Marianne should move and be the governess <laughs> or the artist in the house of the rich and like she has kids and shit like that and she'll be like the wacky aunt. Yeah. You know, the cool like hippie <laughs> aunt that just dances to the moon. But really they're fucking in the guest house. I mean the castle's big enough they could totally sneak around on the Italian guy like fuck that. Do yeah. it. I mean, sequel. I know Celine is not going to do a part two because it's yeah. like, it's supposed to be that way where it's just heart wrenching because they Thanks, couldn't Celine. be together. Wow. But like, man, another queer movie where two queer people can't get together because it's just like the odds are set against them. Like, mm. it's the only thing I hate about it. Right. Let's make it as real as possible, Celine. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for being on this episode. If you guys want to check out more about Lauren, you can find her at Laura underscore Zan on TikTok. And you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. That's it for this episode, my queers. If you like this, please subscribe and follow us on Spotify. Be you, be queer. Stay safe. We'll see you on the next episode.